All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Please join me in welcoming the Chancellor of the University of Colorado Boulder, Dr. Philip DiStefano. Good evening, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you this, e this evening and to welcome you to our panel, Achieving Effective Climate Policy, How Do We Bridge the Political Divide? As part of the Engage Locally series of the Right Here, Right Now Global Climate Summit, we're taking a look at how we can embrace the summit's theme to create positive change in our own local, state, and national communities. The focus of today's summit is obligations, and that's a topic I think quite often about. As a leading public research university, CU Boulder has an obligation to bring together diverse perspectives and create an environment where civil discourse can occur to find solutions to the world's greatest challenges. That's part of what we called, we're called to do as a university. And I also believe it's the way that higher education can support and sustain democracy itself. We also have an obligation to use our research and entrepreneurial resources to innovate and find new ways of doing things. Another of our responsibilities as a university is to graduate leaders of character who can see beyond deadlock to address such challenges across government, nonprofit, and civic organization organization. So I'm especially pleased to welcome CU alumnus and U.S. Representative Joe Neguse to our panel this evening, along with Chris Barnard of the American Conservation Coalition and Jamaica Hodnett of Dream Organization. Each of these people has had success working across the aisle in Washington to pass legislation that addresses the impact of climate change at a time when that is very hard and very difficult to do. And together, our panelists will shed light on how that work can continue and how we can bridge political divides to find common ground on climate policy. And I know we'll learn a lot this evening. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel, Caitlin Kim of Colorado Public Radio. Caitlin is CPR's public affairs reporter based in Washington, D.C., and has been with Colorado Public Radio since 2019. She has deep experience as a journalist, having produced and edited stories for a number of public media outlets around the country, including WNYC, KQED, and more recently for NPR's Weekend Edition. In addition to her editorial expertise, her reporting is informed by stints with the federal government, including working at the State Department and the Department of Defense. She holds a bachelor's degree in history from Wellesley College, a master's degree in international history from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, and a master's degree in international relations and international e economics from Johns Hopkins University. Please join me in welcoming tonight's moderator, Caitlin Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I thought we're all, well, okay. I will introduce everybody and they'll come on out. But I'm going to sit here because, oh, great. Oh, yay. We'll all come out. Sorry. I like company on the stage. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. We're very excited, or I'm very excited about this panel. Sorry, I'll stop getting the mic. <laughs> I'm very excited about this panel. I hope you are as well. Um, it's part of the Right Here, Right Now Global Climate Summit that is hosted, as you heard, by UN United Nations Human Rights and CU Boulder. Um, we're here to talk about something I think is going to be really interesting, which is how do you bridge the political divide on an issue such as climate change? And we have three great panelists here to talk about that. So first off, Congressman Joe Neguse. He represents the second congressional district, which we are all in right now. And aside from being an alum, he was also a regent for CU. 
He does a lot in Congress. I'm just going to highlight a couple of the stuff that I think is relevant for this conversation. He serves on the House Natural Resources Committee. He is the chair of the subcommittee on national parks, forests, and public lands. He has advocated for issues such as the 21st century uh, climate core, um, wildfire, uh, resiliency, watershed, all these things that are very important to the climate. He also serves on the select committee on the climate crisis. And not to put any pressure for you CU uh, students out there, you were also the student body president here as well. I was. There you go. Next is Jamika Hodnett. She is the Green for All campaign director for Dream.org. It's a nonprofit focused on finding common ground on some really tough issues, mass incarceration, uh, economic inequality, and climate change, which is what she works on. Um, She's also been the Law for Black Lives Climate Equity Legal Fellow. She was executive director of Climate Equity for AB Partners. She's worked with the League of Conservation Voters and the Sierra Club. And I, you know, she'll have some really great perspectives as well. And then last but not least, Chris Barnard. Uh, he is with the American Conservative Coalition. He's the National Policy Director. That is also a nonprofit focused on mobilizing young people around common sense, market-based, limited government climate action. I believe the mission is conservative uh, environmental, creating a conservative environmental movement. He's also edited um, the, a book called Green Market Revolution. It's a vision of market environmentalism. He's lived in Europe and the US and you founded the UK version of ACC. Yeah. So again, I think these are three great panelists and uh, let's start. <laughs> So I'm going to start with an easy baseline question, just because when it comes to climate change, there are a lot of points of view, lots of different approaches. And just to give the audience where you sort of stand, if you were sort of the climate czar for the day, and you whatever you wanted could happen, what would be your main approach to dealing with the issue of climate change? Start with you, Representative. Mendes. Sure. Uh, well, first, thank you to, to Caitlin and to the University of Colorado for hosting this incredibly important summit, and congratulations on the success of the summit over the course of the last few days, and obviously in no small part due to the, the chancellor and many of the others here at the university who've been working for a long time to make this happen. Of course, the student leaders, and I know we're joined by a number of elected officials, the mayor of Boulder, uh, our council members, and others. So we appreciate it. And to the scientists, the advocates, the researchers in the room, very grateful to each and every one of you, as well as the students, uh, for bringing your wisdom and your expertise to this important discussion. Uh, I actually, I think that's actually a tough question. It's not, you know, and I work with Caitlin a, a lot uh, in, on Capitol Hill, uh, and we're grateful to her for for coming to the university to to help moderate this panel. So she's always very very good at asking uh, probing questions. Uh, and I think this one is actually maybe more difficult than than perhaps it seems at first blush because. Uh, I don't know that you could wave a magic wand and solve the existential threat of climate change. There are a host of solutions. Uh, I suspect many of those are solutions that, that most folks in this room would concur with, but they wouldn't necessarily solve the fundamental challenge, which is that uh, we have so much in terms of emissions baked into the atmosphere at this point that avoiding at least some of the serious consequences uh, from uh, you know, decades and decades and centuries of that process, metastasizing is almost inevitable. And so a big part of the conversation and a big part of that magic wand would be adaptation, not just uh, obviously actions to try to curb the climate crisis in and of itself. But that being said, uh, to the extent that I did have a magic wand, where my focus would be, I think would be doubling down on the investments that we made this year in the Inflation Reduction Act, which were already historic in scope, to try to, to sort of develop this moonshot around the transition to a renewable energy future. I think most folks who have studied this all agree that technology ultimately is the key to unlocking the pathway to a renewable energy future, figuring out battery and storage technology, uh, and finding the ways in which that is scalable to the point that you know, you could address it uh, on a global scale for 8 billion people is a real complex challenge. And the only way I believe it will be solved is with government investment and partnership with private industry and, and a wide variety of market actors that are doing some pretty 
breathtaking research at places like NREL and NIST and NCAR and UCAR here in Boulder, obviously proud of the ecosystem we have in the second congressional district, but there are many others across the country. So that would be, if I could wave a magic wand, uh, that would be it. All right, Jamika, the wand gets passed to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, it would be about placing power in the hands of communities first. Uh, a lot of uh, legislation that we've seen uh, on climate over the last, I would say, 12 to 13, 13 years has come from the federal level. And then you have a change of administration, things get rolled back, and we're kind of back at square one. And so a lot of my work is really getting back into communities and working with folks in their day-to-day -day lives to build them up as advocates to go and talk to people in their state legislature or their local congressperson to really talk to them about the solutions that they want to see coming into their communities. And like you said, it's like not a um, one size fits all approach. And these are going to have to be really deep conversations to talk about the energy grid in the community, the sort of natural resources the community has, the sort of clean energy technologies that would work best for that community and really putting that power back in the hands of the folks um, at the local level. And so for me, it would really be sort of a political shift to thinking about things at the local level in terms of priorities. Chris? Well, first I wanna echo the Congressman and, and say thank you to the university for organizing this great event. And also to my distinguished fellow panelists and Caitlin as well for moderating this. It's, it's really great to be here with you all. Uh, I thought I'd start by answering that question in two different ways, um, the kind of general climate way and then also the political way. Uh, like the Congressman said, fundamentally, climate change is a technological problem. You need innovation to move from polluting energy sources to clean energy sources that can power our economies in a way that doesn't have an impact on the climate. And so we need to think about the ways that we can do that. And like the Congressman said, we need to work with the private sector, we need to work with corporations, and there is a role for the government to do that. And we need those public-private relationships to scale up the innovation necessary to tackle a problem like climate change. From the political perspective, I'm curious, uh, gonna ask you all a question. Uh, could you please put up your hand if you identify as a conservative or conservative leaning? For those at home, everyone put up their hand, it's really cool. <laughs> So, so keep your hand up. More than one might expect. Yeah. Older, so look, that's not a bad. It's very good. Like, so keep up your hand. <laughs> keep up your hand if you also care about climate change and environmental issues. No one put down their hand, and and that's really my message tonight: is don't believe people when they tell you that conservatives don't care about this issue. We've struggled to communicate it. There are people in our movement that have not done a good job of being honest about the issue. But we do care and we are ready to tackle these problems with Congressman Nagus, with Jamaica's organization, and with you all in this room. And from a political perspective, we cannot tackle this problem if both sides of the aisle are not at the table. And that's why my organization, the American Conservation Coalition, is so excited to provide a conservative voice to help tackle climate change with everyone that agrees with us that this is a problem. And even globally, if you look at other countries, around a third of the governments around the world are conservative or center-right in some shape or form. We cannot tackle climate change if those countries are not a part of the solution. And so we need to stop talking about this as a red team versus blue team issue, but as we can all tackle this together, and that's why I'm so excited to be part of this panel. And from the political perspective, that's really how we need to tackle climate change. And I thank you because you set up the next question really well for me, which is, how do you do that? How do you not make it a red issue versus a blue issue, especially when it does, has become so politicized? You know, Congressman Nagus, you hear it in the halls of Congress. Anybody who talks about, you know, environmental change is some sort of environmental radical. Anybody who talks about fossil fuels is, you know, married to old ways of doing things. How do you, from what your perspective, get that dialogue going and find a place to get common ground? Because as you mentioned, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a strong investment in climate policies, was done on a partisan level. But infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which also had climate investments, the CHIPS Act, which also had climate investments, 
were done on a bipartisan process. Uh, process. Mm -hmm. So who want Jamika, we'll let you tackle this question first. So I literally like to go back to history. So for me, I'm a conservationist at heart. I am an environmental justice advocate. And so when I think about the people that have in the past been uh, really avid green advocates or conservationists, it's been Republicans. Teddy Roosevelt spent, you know, three days in the wilderness with John Muir and came out and formed the National Park Service. This was back in the early 1900s. You've got Richard Nixon who uh, established the uh, NEPA and also Earth Day and also the Council for Environmental Quality. And the EPA. And the EPA, and the right. Water Act, yeah. <laughs> He was, you know, coined by, I, I believe, Greenpeace as the greenest president. Um, and even all the way up into the, uh, you know, 1989 and 1990, uh, Bush Sr. Uh, established the first uh, climate assessment. And so for me, history and conservationists has shown that it's been Republicans. And it's just been very recently that it's been sort of this kind of backpedaling. And I'm, I'm like, we are already on the same side. We've already been on the same side for a long time. And it's just time from what I see for us to get out of each other's way and really lead on solutions because we really do not have the time to keep bickering back and forth. Yeah, I mean, obviously fully agree with that. I'll also throw in that Reagan signed the Montreal Protocol, which is probably the best example of an international agreement on environmental issues that really worked. Uh, from a perspective of how to kind of cross the barrier politically, it's really important to lead with your values first. I mean, not a single American will say they don't like clean air, clean water. I mean, you're in one of the most beautiful states in the country. I consider it the, the most beautiful state. And everyone here cares about nature. They care about hiking, they care about fishing, they care about hunting, and that's a value statement. And I think one of the problems at the political level is that we've tended to impose these purity tests on climate change as an issue. It's like, do you believe in net zero by 2050? Do you believe in the Green New Deal? Do you believe in what the IPCC says? And for a lot of Republicans, it's it's they've often be often be really uncomfortable in those situations because we've kind of led with these abstract ideas rather than with our personal values first. And so to my Democratic colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I, I like to talk about going on a hike together, why we care about nature, what is your favorite experience growing up camping with your friends or whatever it might be. And I think that's really where you can get a lot more Republicans on board to disarm them that this is not a Trojan horse to pass a socialist Green New Deal, but this is because it's an issue that needs to be tackled, that we care about, and that we can rally our, our shared values around. And that's really how we should be approaching this uh, political problem. Yeah, I, I think both of my panelists articulated well the approach that one should take and that our political decision makers should be taking to try to forge common ground on this consequential issue. I guess from my vantage point, to the extent there is gridlock in pushing forward solutions to address climate change and to the extent it's become a you know, sort of black and white issue as far as uh, uh, political parties are concerned, it's more symptomatic of the larger political discord that exists in our political system today. So that is to say, I don't, I don't think the debate around climate change is necessarily uh, uniquely partisan, right. right? And in the halls of Congress, right. there are uh, fever pitched battles on virtually every public policy issue, yeah. which includes uh, climate change. I think that it's more a function of the atrophy of our political system over the course of the last 40, 50 years and, and kind of the, the, the way in which we have political debates that are now largely devoid of nuance. And, yeah. um, you know, folks are far more willing to, I think, impugn the motives of, mm -hmm. you know, you're, someone whom you're debating in good faith uh, on a particular policy issue. And it's hard to find common ground when yeah. you question one's motives, right? Um, right? When you don't approach the conversation from a values proposition, mm -hmm. as you said, which I think is so so accurate. Uh, one of my favorite speeches of any political figure was President Kennedy's speech in 1963 at American University. It's called the, the Peace Speech, uh, where he kind of talks about famous lines of, you know, we are, we are all 
we, we share so much in common. We all breathe the same air. You know, we, we cherish our children's future. We're all mortal. And it kind of underscores this common humanity that, that connects us all. Fundamentally, I think every single person in this room, I suspect every person who's watching virtually, uh, cares about conserving our natural resources and enjoys hiking in Rocky Mountain National Park to the extent they're a Coloradan or maybe not a Coloradan, uh, just as me and my family do. So I think a values proposition is is the best place to start and building from that. And we've done that. And you know, you've covered some of our efforts in the Congress around wildfires in particular, which you know, have no particular political bias. They will it will rage through a Democratic community or a Republican community. Uh, right? it, it, it doesn't respect jurisdictional lines. We had an event here at CU, I want to say maybe six months ago, with John Curtis, who's a Republican member of Congress from Utah, who chairs the bipartisan wildfire caucus with me. We created it together. He represents a district in Utah that includes Park City. He claims it's more beautiful than our district. He's, <laughs> he's wrong, but uh, but we get along quite well on a number of issues, including uh, wildfire mitigation, resiliency, and some of the solutions, which include, uh, obviously, conversations about climate change in light of the, the pervasiveness of these wildfires and the frequency uh, because of the drought that we're experiencing here in Colorado and Utah and the Rocky Mountain West. So anyway, I digress, but it's an example, I think, of a way in which you, you find a path to collaborating. Well, not to drill down sure. and hammer this too much, but like, but how do you do that? Because, you know, you talk about values, you talk about that as the starting point, but when it gets down to the sort of the nitty gritty and actually trying to decide, because there are such different approaches to climate change, when someone wants to focus more on private sector versus public sector, how do you sit down, have these conversations and come to a, sometimes it's a political, a dirty word in politics, a compromise where, yeah. No one gets everything that they want, but they get part of what they want. And yeah, you not. have worked with Representative Curtis, who's part of the conservative conservation mm -hmm. uh, group in Congress. I mean, I think you do it the same way that city councils and uh, you know boardrooms in corporate America and uh, you know nonprofit uh, yeah. rooms and in, in, you know, across our country do it. You you sit down and you have tough conversations, and you ultimately try to find the common denominator. At the end of the day, uh, to the extent that you're unable to reach uh, an agreement on some of the top line items, you, you you get the half a loaf that you can, right? Because a half a loaf is certainly better than no loaf at all. You mentioned a couple of the, the achievements of the last 117th Congress. We're still currently in the 117th, but we're already thinking about the 118th Congress. Uh, but the last two years, the Infrastructure Bill, the Chips and Science Act, the Kigali Amendment, which was uh, ratified by the Senate, that, that is a huge deal. You know, it's not on the front page of newspapers, but what it will do in terms of regulating um, uh, refrigerants, right, and, and their contributions to uh, the degradation of our planet, incredibly important. And my sense is that all of those bipartisan reforms and accomplishments were the byproduct of having honest, candid, tough conversations, empathizing, listening to one's point of view, recognizing uh, that uh, you know your, your worldview uh, is not the only one and may not be the only right one. And I, I think that's that as a far better approach in terms of actually getting somewhere. Yeah, it was my sense. I could definitely add in, just like you said, I've worked at big green nonprofit organizations and even inside of the organization, we don't all agree on the approach to solving the climate crisis. You know, I'm I'm a black woman, and so I'm in a space, and um, my community might not be represented. You know, I hold a bunch of different identities. I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. It's technically in Appalachia. Sometimes when I'm talking to folks, you know, in D.C., I don't feel like my community is represented as well. It's rural, and so I am constantly also having to bring in these things around. So what about the local voice? What about the rural voice? What about black communities? What about, you know, how is this going to impact, you know, our folks day to day lives? And I keep having to bring it back to that. And so it's not difficult for me to try to build lines across difference because I have to do it every day in coalition. It's like, I think that the, the perception is that we're all on the same page on the left, but the reality is so different. 
you know, I just, I, I, I'll just jump in here because it's, I think I can offer an example. Most of the folks here, I suspect, work in the private sector. How many of you work in the private sector? You know, so, right, folks who work at small businesses, nonprofits, how difficult would your life be if you were to, you know, tweet out tomorrow that one of your coworkers, uh, you know, was the worst person on earth because they didn't agree with your particular view about a project that you're working on and that you're trying to make the case to your colleagues to approve, right? Not the smartest strategy yeah. to ultimately achieve the outcome that you're pushing towards, right? Far better to try to cajole and convince and persuade that person, right? That's not how it works in Congress, as you know. Uh, and if you go on Twitter tonight and you look up, you know, the, the tweets of any number of politicians on either side of the aisle, you will find uh, an environment replete with tweets of disdain for, you know, uh, people who disagree with their own worldview. And it's it's that temptation to kind of uh, to to go to the lowest common denominator. I think, unfortunately, makes subsequent conversations and negotiations very, very difficult. And yeah. that that's that's the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges I think right now. Okay. I, I know you have a lot of really good questions. I agree with everything they said, so no need to-, to... <laughs> Because my, actually, my next question is actually kind of more geared towards you. One of the things, all three of you are on this panel because you do believe that climate change is an issue and needs to be dealt with. There are still people out there who don't think it's an issue and don't think government needs to do anything about it. From where you guys sit, how do you convince those people to take action, to, to, to negotiate when the status quo works for them? So there's a really interesting statistic that we uh, will actually be releasing as part of a broader poll, and I don't think I'm upsetting too many of my colleagues by saying it now, but 80% of Americans actually believe that climate science is settled. And so I think we've, we're, we're able to move beyond that and actually start talking about solutions and like you mentioned, John Curtis, he founded the Conservative Climate Caucus. It's the second largest caucus in the House for Republicans. There's nearly 100 Republican members of Congress in this caucus. And the, by, the bylaws say we believe in climate change, essentially. And so that, to me, shows that we have been able to move beyond this question about the science and actually start talking about solutions. And obviously, you'll always have voters and people that don't think that the science is settled. And those are, those are people that you sometimes have to deal with but they're increasingly drifting into irrelevance. And so I don't think expending political energy on them is really worth our time that much. I think talking about solutions, uh, sometimes maybe talking about it in ways that we know conservatives are more comfortable with, um, that's the way forward rather than just keep talking about the science. How do you think conservatives would be more comfortable talking about it? Just more of a conservation, sort of the, the values that you mentioned? Well, so for example, in, in a poll we released earlier this year, we found that when we ask people what they're most worried about when it comes to climate change, the top two things that come up are clean air and clean water and impacts on wildlife. Those are the top three, two issues that Americans care about when asked about how climate change will impact their lives. Who doesn't like wildlife? Who doesn't like clean air and clean water, right? So if you talk about how reducing emissions, moving to clean energy will create cleaner air, will cr create cleaner water, uh, how protecting our national parks, protecting our working lands is good for wildlife. Those are the ways that you talk to people across the board. And so it's not just talking about uh, climate, climate in the abstract, but in the way that it actually impacts people's lives to what you said. And so I think those are some of the terms that you can use that actually really are popular across the board. Yeah. Can I, I'm just curious from the, your perspectives, all three of you, where do you think government is most effective? I mean, Jamika, I'm assuming you would think local government would be most effective in dealing with this or, but yeah. yeah. I think um, really where government can do the best work is really by um, taking on this whole role of being the implementer of certain solutions. Like for example, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is trying to draw down some funds from the IRA to a bunch of local communities that we picked on the ground that we think that we have good robust relationships with local governments and that we can help facilitate the process because it could be you know mired in red tape and all these different bureaucratic issues and so 
you know, because we have people on our staff that understands the, the federal government process for bringing down funds and then people who understand local government, I think like we're positioned in a place to be able to sort of facilitate those conversations. And so government can do what it does best by getting the funds where they need to go and working with the communities where they're based to, to, to really have this sort of wrap around approach. Otherwise, it'll be like any other fund where the money just sits there for years on years. It doesn't move to the people that need it, right? And so I think I think that that's where they could be most effective. Chris? Yeah, I have two things to say. The first one, it'll sound very conservative, but I promise it actually is very American. Um, <laughs> in, in 2009, Obama wanted to, to pass the Waxman-Markey uh, climate yeah. bill, which would be the most ambitious climate bill the US had ever passed at the time, right? They failed, they weren't able to do it. And fast forward a decade, a little over a decade, we had actually exceeded the emission reduction targets of Waxman-Markey without a big government bill. Mm -hmm. And that happened because of American innovation and the American private sector. I mean, one of the reasons that we reduce emissions more than the next eight countries combined is because we move from coal to natural gas in a lot of uh, places. And that's been incredibly beneficial for the climate. It's also been incredibly beneficial for the US economy. And that happened in the absence of, of government involvement. And that's not to say that there shouldn't be government involvement and that we can't do more, we must do more, but it also shows the, the role of the private sector and the power of innovation to really reduce emissions and, and take the, a place at the table. The second thing I'll, th I'll say is a conversation that's been very relevant recently and will be especially relevant next Congress is this idea of permitting reform. Right now, we have a, a permitting process in the US which is imposed by the government that actually disproportionately harms clean energy projects from being built. Nearly half of the projects delayed under our permitting process are clean energy projects. 15% are fossil fuel projects. So right now what we have is a government imposed permitting uh, minefield of red tape that is actually holding back the very clean energy projects that we need to tackle climate change. And I'm very encouraged that there are a lot of Democrats, including the president talking about this. And I really hope that that will be a really good opportunity for bipartisan work next Congress so that we can actually re remove some of those barriers for the private sector to do what it do does best and innovate and build and make America a leader in clean energy. And, and I think that's really one of the best ways forward uh, for the next Congress. Representative Deguse? A couple thoughts, I'd say. So first, just taking a step back to a previous question about kind of the nature of the debate around climate change in the halls of yeah. Congress. And my sense is, we, to Chris's point, we've moved away from a debate about whether climate change exists and and its causes. I mean, I you know, there are people who believe that we've never landed on the moon. We don't, you know, and there may be members of Congress who you know represent that view. I don't know, but um, and I'm not going to venture to take guesses. But 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 at the end of the day, the vast majority of the American people, as Chris said, agree uh, that, that climate change is is uh, is real. They experience the visceral impacts of that in terms of climate fuel disasters that are happening all across the country, including right here in Colorado, in terms of the the wildfires that I mentioned. Uh, and they recognize that we need to to do something about it. The debate in Congress is is far more about the geopolitical, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, stakes and the way in which other countries are responding vis-a-vis -vis our own response, um, issues around cost and issues around the best ways to kind of approach the, the challenge. So I actually think that is a step in the right direction and we ought to have honest debates like the debate that we're having tonight. In terms of the role of government, I, what I would say, I agree with, 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 for the most part, with what my panelists, fellow panelists have mentioned. I, I guess I one nuance to Chris's answer that I'd wanna uh, kind of expound upon a little bit is that, yes, the private sector has a huge role to play, particularly around scalability. Uh, you know, in terms of innovation. And there is no question that our ability to curb emissions over the course of the last decades is in no small part uh, to the actions of the private sector. And in the absence of perhaps federal regulatory action, right? Uh, obviously, there was the Clean Power Plan that right. the Obama administration right. attempted to implement, and, right. and of course, constitutional issues that arose uh, thereunder. But 
there are a variety of states, including mm -hmm. Colorado, that took legislative action, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the reason why Colorado has made the transition that it has over the course of the last decade is because of the Clean Power Plan enacted under Governor Ritter uh, many, many years ago, 12 years ago now. Uh, and obviously the utility models here in our state responding to that. So it's it, it's not an either or. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. The government has a critical role to play. Uh, sometimes that's on the regulatory side and it's at the subnational level. And oftentimes at the subnational level, because of the realities of how difficult it is to get something through Congress um, and the reality that also at the local level, cities, municipalities yeah. mm -hmm. that have taken various steps to change their own energy supplies, they can be more nimble in taking those steps than the federal government can, right? Um, so that I think is important. In terms of the most important thing I think that the federal government can do, I think it is incentivizing subnational entities, states, cities, individuals yeah. to be a part of the renewable energy transition, right? Yeah. And it's the research and development. It's supporting the incredible ecosystem of federal laboratories uh, that are partnering with private industry to develop the innovation that ultimately is the key to unlocking the renewable energy future. And just to, to add very quickly one thing, and I know we have to move to Q and A as well. <laughs> uh, I think that's also the way the founders intended it, right? With the idea of like laboratories of democracy and it allows for different states to try different things and see what works best. And I think one example I, li I like to bring it up is that often people look at California as a leader when it comes to tackling climate change. But for example, a state like Texas has actually decarbonized faster than California when you look at the uh, relevant GDP growth. And Texas, if it were a state, if it were a country, would be the fifth largest producer of wind energy in the world. And, and Texas is a Republican state. I know Matt's done a lot of work uh, on how red states have actually rolled out a lot of the clean energy projects that are advancing decarbonization in the U.S., and I think the importance of, of doing work at the state level is that different states can try different things to see what works for their state, to, to, to see what works for their people. And I think that's a really important thing uh, about America. And I think that's something that we really are, are, should be embracing and, and allowing more of. Great. Oh. Can I hop right in? Uh, yeah, one sure. One second. I know we talked about the role of government. We talked about the role of business but we haven't really talked about the role of like the individual or civil society organizations and how the collective could be using their grassroots power to really affect change. For example, you know, the transition away from coal, that didn't just happen. That came from a grassroots well of people saying, actually, we don't want this in our communities anymore. We want to transition to clean energy. It's not only affecting our air and health and water and everything else, but it's also now affecting our climate. And so I just want to also put a plug in here that it's also about individual efforts, people going and talking to their legislators, people educating their community members, people standing up and saying, hey, we need a different economy. We need a different sort of world. And we want to be involved in this and deeply involved in this transition. I think that even for myself and my family, like I think a lot of folks have like sort of taken the foot off the gas and say, we're just going to hand it to our legislators and they'll figure it out. But I think now we're like, absolutely not. <laughs> All right, well, you're going to get a break from my questions and we are going to go to a couple of audience questions right now. We're going to hear from uh, leaders, a leader from the CU student government, um, an elected official from Boulder and a CU faculty member. So we're going to start with the faculty member first. Hi, everybody. Um, Matt Burgess, assistant professor of environmental studies uh, here at CU. Thanks, everybody, for being on this panel. Thanks, Congressman DeGoose, for doing this Four. twice in a year. Four. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my question is, what is what do you think is the role of patriotism in solving climate and especially a bipartisan approach to climate? And the reason I ask this, this is a hypothesis I hope to test in my research soon. Uh, so I'm an economist and there's lots of evidence in economics in other contexts besides climate that big projects, like, including things like social safety nets, require strong shared identities among mm -hmm. citizens to gain political support. 
And if I look at climate, concern for climate in this country is somewhat negatively correlated with patriotism. Uh, and, and I think you sometimes see that in, in the narratives, uh, in some of the narratives around, around climate change, that they, they, can, uh, they can veer from being uh, critical to being anti-American, some would say anti-West, some would say anti-human. <laughs> uh, and so is there, is, do you think there's something to that? And, and, and how can we uh, you know, fix this problem, which, which requires reflecting on what is going wrong, right, in our society in part? but still be patriotic? And is, do you see it as important? Mm -hmm. Who wants to go first? We're I'll gonna go, go first. first. Okay. There you go. I shot myself in the foot yeah. with that question. <laughs> um, I think one of the problems with the current climate dialogue is that we've not framed this as an opportunity for America. And especially with, I mean, John Kerry saying that, oh, we got to make sure that while Putin is invading Ukraine, he remembers his climate commitments. That's not very compelling to most Americans, right? And I think really what we like to talk about is that this is an opportunity for America to lead the world, to lead the world in clean energy, to lead the world in new technology, uh, and to, to forge relationships with other nations, but also crucially to, to hold others like China accountable. And that's really from our polling, a message that resonates with a lot of Americans, because the reality is it doesn't matter if America goes to zero emissions tomorrow, and it won't, it won't do a thing to tackle climate change if countries like China don't reduce their emissions as well. And so I think really we should talk, be talking about this in, uh, in this kind of idea of opportunity for America to lead the world, to, to really show the way forward. Uh, and I think that's something that resonates with a lot of people from the polling that we've done. Sure. Um, <laughs> It's an interesting question. I mean, I, I guess what I would say is I don't disagree with the premise, and I suspect you know your, the empirical research you've done supports the thesis that uh, that climate change is negatively correlated to uh, patriotism, let's say. But I, my sense, and maybe I'm belaboring the point here, is that, again, that is symptomatic of a larger disease. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be curious as to whether or not if you polled a series of other issues that one would identify as consequential, or others might say existential, how they would be correlated to patriotism as well. I, I think that is a symptom, and the larger disease is ultimately the, the, the lack of an ability for us to see each other as fellow citizens, which has waned over the course of the last several decades. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, the, the sort of social media and any any number of of reasons that drive that. Have you ever read the book Bowling Alone? So of course, right? I mean, how many people have read Bowling Alone here? Yeah, a couple of folks. How many people here are part of a bowling league or have ever been a part of a bowling league? Even Chancellor De Stefano didn't raise his hand. I figured he might have been part of a bowling league. So I don't know if he's particularly good at bowling, but uh, I encourage you all to read the book Bowling Alone, and it it does a, a just it's a thought-provoking book right that talks about the kind of the decay of civil society over the course of the last several decades uh, if you go back to the 1960s and even 1970s uh, and you were an american male between the ages of 18 and 48 or 50 or 55 odds are you were a member of a bowling league and in that bowling league you would come across other americans who came from completely different walks of life who were of different professions, perhaps of different religions, and that common visceral bond that you would develop by virtue of that activity, right, uh, enables you to see each other's fates as connected, each other's futures and the futures of your respective families as connected. Bowling leagues weren't the only you know, uh, apparatus that enabled you to do that. Uh, obviously, religious institutions, civic organizations, your rotaries, right? Um, those kinds of organizations, participation in which has you know, declined severely over the course, again, of that last 40, 50 years. And so that, again, my sense is it's not really about climate change. It's that if we don't see each other as fellow citizens, then we're not necessarily as interested or invested in taking collective action to address a challenge that faces us both perhaps equally, perhaps unequally. And 
that climate change is a good example. So we're, we need to figure out a way to repair those faults and, and, and find a way to kind of uh, rekindle that patriotism, which is crucially important because it fundamentally is is what ties us together as Americans, right? I mean, we are, we're a country founded on ideals and principles, not on a heterogeneous ethnicity or, or, or religion. So really important. And I guess I've gotten way off a field of climate change. But, yes. but. I can add one, one more thing. Um, I think for me, and I think everybody's patriotism looks different. For me, and probably for many Americans, it's, you know, dealing with the issue of climate change is like, about having a sense of responsibility for yourself, others in the world, and being in the seat of power in the United States. Like we have a, we have a responsibility to take action um, to address something that's uh, happening to the global community. It's what we've done in the past. It's what we should be doing now. And I think this, we were talking about COP earlier and our absence from COP and what that has done to COP over the last four years, right? And the pulling out of the Paris Agreement and how there was so much momentum up to 2016 when Obama was there and signed the Paris Agreement. And um, I worked on that and I worked on the Compact of Mayors and we had like 115 mayors from across the country go and be in Paris and a part of this big summit. And there was just so much, so much momentum there. And our absence from that space and from organizing in that space really showed from what I saw at this current COP. And so again, for me, it harkens back to this point of like, what sort of responsibility do we have in the world considering how much power we hold? And what do we, what we, what do we need to be doing with that power? Hi there. My name is Chase Cromwell. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs, CU Boulder Student Government. I'll say I get made fun of a lot for how much time I spend bowling over in the UNC. So uh, you and Chancellor DeStefano have a standing invite to come join us someday. Um, the last several years and the last several decades, Congress has passed a lot of massive omnibus spending bills. And, and a lot of our work on climate and other issues has been these huge bills that have required significant majorities and vote whipping and making sure that we just get the one party that's in charge to pass these big bills. My question is, how can we modernize our policymaking efforts so that we can transition from these massive and frequent spending bills to more operational and like ongoing legislative efforts? It's a great question. Uh, and again, uh, at the risk of being sort of too esoteric and, and divorcing it from climate change, because obviously the, the same complaint, I think, uh, a rightful complaint, I would say, well justified, could be made about any host of other public policy challenges that the Congress takes on. The Congress that is functioning today is certainly not functioning under the sort of Madisonian principles that you know our founders and framers, uh, I think, intended. If it were up to me, if I could wave a magic wand, as far as congressional procedure is concerned, uh, I would try to emulate the way in which the Colorado legislature functions, right? So the, the simplest way to do this, instead of sort of the top-down omnibus approach and uh, uh, an approach that is largely centralized in the top leadership, as Caitlin knows, within each chamber in the Congress, rank and file members of Congress uh, having very little influence, right? except me, of course, but, you know, everybody, but, but, uh, but no, I mean, you know, the truth is, again, it's just, it's a very top-down structure. Uh, the Colorado legislature functions very differently. Why? Because the voters of Colorado, how many folks are familiar with the gavel amendment uh, by a show of hands, right? We have obviously, you know, the mayor's cheating, obviously the mayor, the mayor should know that, you know, should be familiar with that, but gavel amendment in Colorado, the voters approved a measure that essentially compels the state legislature to consider every bill that is introduced. So irrespective of how good an idea it is or how bad an idea it is, that bill is heard, right? Uh, and it, it has its day. And you know, members of the state legislature uh, have to then, you know, uh, make a take a position and, and let the chips fall where they may, uh, rises and falls on its own merits. I think that system is far more robust and, and leads to better legislative product and, and does not, you don't end up 
in sort of this funnel of just doing the omnibus bills that are led largely by leadership on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers of the Congress. So. I feel like you guys would never go home then. We would frankly. never go home. It's probably yeah. true. I mean, it would be, yeah. well, there's a limit. In the legislature, after the Gavel Amendment was passed, the state legislature adopted its own internal rules that say every member can only introduce five bills subject to waivers that they receive from leadership, right? So it's, you know, you, you get elected to the state legislature, you work on preparing your five, and those five are going to go through the process. And I, there's something to be said about, I'm still trying to find <laughs> Other members of Congress who will support me in that endeavor. <laughs> I'm assuming you guys don't want to talk about the omnibus, or do you? Well, I just I can't really speak to the mechanics of lawmaking, obviously, but just one observation is in climate politics, because it's is seen as such a huge problem, there is a tendency to want to pass everything all at once. And sometimes the problem is that we then make the perfect the enemy of the good. And I think a really good example of this was uh, the Energy Act of 2020, which was very bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was at that point the single largest investment in clean energy technology in U.S. history. And there were members that, uh, like specifically on the progressive side of the Democratic Party, who weren't on board with it because it didn't go far enough. But it still was at that point the most historic investment in clean energy. From their perspective, not enough, but it's better than nothing, right? And so I think that we need to be uh, willing to sometimes make compromises to take incremental steps and also to make laws on on like individual issues one one example that that we like to talk about is the growing climate solutions act which passed the senate uh, with 93 votes in favor and only seven against and it would basically allow for farmers and rural uh, populations and landowners to use their lands to sequester carbon and get compensated for that so it basically allows rural populations to play a role in tackling climate change that still hasn't um, the passed in the House because there are people that think it doesn't go far enough or it's not perfect enough. And I think we need to be able to make laws on individual issues like that that actually do move the ball forward. Uh, and I think the Senate did a great job of passing it in such, such a bipartisan way. And I think we, we making more laws on an individual basis like that on specific issues is actually a really good thing. All right. So we have one last question. We're going to go, I'm going to apologize now. We're going to go a little over. So my question, because I figured <laughs> like we only have two minutes left. Hi, everyone. I am Rachel Friend with Boulder City Council. Thank you all for the thought provoking and stimulating discussion tonight. Um, and I do have a son at CU who's off bowling right now. So I want to say, I think so. I, I'm just, <laughs> you all are doing something alone. right yeah. here. Okay. So um, going back to the initial magic wand discussion and the needed climate crisis adaptation, since we can't avert the crisis anymore, you all have alluded to it's going to roll down and land on, on municipalities and local governments, right? That's where the adaptation is going to land. It will fall to cities. Um, but I want to say it's really tricky even in a blue city to yeah. get the adaptations done. Um, I think that we we agree in theory, but we tend not to agree on right here, right now at right. the local level. Um, so my question is, are there things that other levels of government or the private sector can do to help us build the bridges or um, somehow incentivize the hard things that we need to do to have the um, ability to implement the adaptations that it is really gonna fall to us so that we can, um, essentially sprint instead of fight because yeah. it's now thanks it's a great question uh, and of course we're grateful to you councilwoman and to the mayor uh, and all the local elected officials who i think are sort of showing the way you know, again subnational level as you know and I, as i've talked about before i brag a lot about the work that our city councils and our county commissions do in my district and in the state of colorado and i suspect my colleagues do the same and in their respective states as well, because that's a, where most of the action is happening, or at least certainly was, you know, uh, prior to this 117th Congress. Look, I, I think the challenge is so many of the laws on the books that are the sort of linchpins to adaptation were written and enacted a century ago or longer. You know, our land use laws, as you well know. Uh, you know, are the laws regarding investor-owned utilities? We were I was going to get in this debate about regulatory capture and you know the Texas deregulated model, which you know, as you said rightly, uh, has enabled Texas to make some real gains as far as renewable energy uh, development is concerned. Uh, and there's you know efforts afoot in other states to potentially mimic or emulate that model. 
I think it's tough. It's it's convincing policymakers, not so much at the federal level. I mean, yes, there's there are reforms that can happen at FERC, and obviously, you know, permitting reforms is a is sort of a, a hot topic of debate right now in Washington. But at the end of the day, I think it's more going to be a question for state legislatures mm -hmm. and what actions do they take mm -hmm. to give local jurisdictions more flexibility and enable you all to be more agile in adapting. And it again extends beyond climate. It, affordable housing, there are all kinds of yeah. myriad of issues, right, where city councils and, and uh, town councils and county commissions have their hands largely tied uh, because the laws that are on the books have been there for 80, 90, 100 years and, and haven't really been changed or modified to comport with a 21st century, you know, challenge like climate change. Yeah. For me, I think um, I think that cities and local municipalities are going to have to start sharing some of the solutions that they've been implementing uh, to the climate crisis. Like, for example, in D.C., D.C. is one of the most progressive RPSs in the country. And one of the things that they did uh, to really sort of get solar technology to low income residents across D.C. was a solar for all program. And so the mandate for the program was to provide solar for 100,000 uh, residents across DC that, that were under a certain area median income. And so they did this, They um, it was sort of like an offshoot bill from the RPS and they pulled in so many different, uh, they pulled in local solar businesses, they pulled in regular businesses to, to use their rooftops for the solar for people that we're not in single family homes. It was like a real deep community effort. And I feel like that, you know, there are examples like that happening already across the country that we need to be sharing with one another um, so that we can get creative, be smart and, you know, get moving on these things. Two, two very quick things. The first is again, on the permitting aspect, that's a federal law that is impeding local development of infrastructure. That's not, not only necessary for clean energy, but also just building bridges and roads and the things that we really need because our infrastructure really is crumbling in this country. I think it's not just about infrastructure either when it comes to permitting, uh, for example, wildfire mitigation. A lot of the land out West is owned by the federal government and that makes it more difficult for local municipalities to take the steps necessary to make us less vulnerable to wildfires. And so finding ways to devolve that power to local communities is I think, the right constitutional constitutional thing to do, but also the most effective thing to do. Uh, the second point is listening to constituents. Um, for example, one issue that my organization works a lot on is nuclear energy. And a lot of people don't like nuclear and there might be parts of the country where voters are not in favor of it and fine, then, then don't have nuclear. But there are other areas that are really embracing it. Like West Virginia just repealed its ban on nuclear energy because the, vote, the, the voters in that state recognize that coal is not the future, so what else is? And a just energy transition mm -hmm. in that state would demand transitioning to nuclear plants. Wyoming, Montana, a lot of Western states are also moving in that direction. There was a bill in Colorado in the state Senate to, to do something similar here, to have a study on the role of nuclear to transition old coal plants into small modular reactors. I testified in favor of that bill, but it, it failed. And sometimes we have to be okay with things like that failing. Uh, and different constituencies have different responses and think we need to be more open to that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're already over. So I'm gonna make this one last question really quick because I think we should end on a positive note. We're on a college campus. There are a lot of students here. 15 seconds, what can they do to help create the bipartisan environment you all need to do your work? Start with you, Chris. So my organization has uh, a, a climate plan that we call the climate commitment. It's not partisan. It's common sense, it's pro-innovation, pro-American ideas and policies. You can check it out at theclimatecommitment.com. And that's really what we're hoping to, to work on in a bipartisan way next Congress, because it's a divided Congress. So we need Republicans and Democrats at the table. And so we'll be using those ideas from the climate commitment to really push forward climate, uh, a climate agenda in a bipartisan way. Jamika? For me, I tell folks to find a political home. And that home should, you know, have a pillar where they're focusing on climate change in the way that speaks to you. And then, you know, as a part of that political home, you need to be in your legislators' offices, up their butts, talking to them all the time, talking to them all the time.
so that you can see the you know the the things that you want as a part of the agenda for your community on the table and so i just always implore people to be deeply involved i was going to say do more bowling but a lot of people are bowling here but a lot uh, <laughs> I, I guess what I would say, and again, maybe it, it seems counterintuitive, I think develop a friendship, a partnership a relationship with someone who has a completely wor different worldview than your own. Because to the extent you are able to convince them on the merits uh, that climate change is an existential threat worth tackling uh, and that there are some really practical solutions that we ought to be implementing to, to do so, you will have done your country and and i think the planet a great service and so that that to me is the probably the most effective thing you could do yeah right well i'd like to give a big round of applause to congressman nagus jamika hadnett and chris barnard thank you very much for a really great robust discussion thank you to the university of boulder for hosting this and for the human right united nations human rights uh right here right now the global climate summit enjoy the rest of your time here thank you very much and thanks for your patience Successful.